Good evening. Welcome to the March 16th Joint Department Head Review um, sitting with the Select Board and the Budget Finance Committee. I'd like to call this meeting to order. First, first matter is the minutes of our March 2nd meeting. Can I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. We'll slide right into department head review, public works. Let's go ahead and start with your regular budget. Then we'll look at solid waste and then CIP. All right. So the, the regular operating budget, uh, we're up 22,800 in the salaries budget. That's the public works side of the person that we're looking to hire for parks and rec. Uh, we're going to use him for plowing or that person for plowing. We're trying to reduce um, the time on one of the trucks. We're also picking up uh, about two and a half miles on Gore Road and Brown Road from the town of Gray. That's all part of the deal we made with Gray when we um, took that section of, well, we got that section of road repaired and took it back for town road. Uh, right now, that one truck that we've got doing all that stuff down there is, a, is, is about two and a half hours on his turnaround. Um, a little shorter, and this is how it's gonna work. He's also gonna be a backup driver if we lose a guy due to illness or time off. Right now, we don't have any spare drivers. We don't have any spare um, plan. If somebody's out on a, on a regular route truck, it's either myself or Scott that's gonna be in the truck, which puts strain on everybody through the department. Um, this will help us out with that greatly. And also will help us out in the summer with the parks, the beaches and all of that stuff that's being neglected right now. The other item um, would be the road striping that's going up $2,000. That's simply the increase in cost of material. And we added three and a half miles of road that we striped. Um, that we never stri striped before, but under some requests from residents, we added it to the striping. Street signs again is up $500. It's in increase in cost of product. Uh, utilities, we added $1,000 to utilities. Uh, we installed heat in the trailer down in the San Sal building for winter operations. Um, the next, that's it for the budget. You want to go right into the uh, MSW and recycling contract? Sure. Okay. We are uh, negotiating a new contract with uh, Pine Tree Waste, or it's, it's actually uh, Casella Waste. Um, I'd asked for a five-year contract. Uh, the first year, they went up 3% and 2% for the next four years after that. Uh, that is an increase of 4000 I'm sorry, $8,185.47 in the pickup. In the, in, the, in the transportation pickup and transportation of both MSW and recycling. The big expense this year is the cost for the tipping fees for the recycling. For the last contract, uh, Pine Tree Waste has been absorbing the cost of the recycling tipping fees. So we had no cost to that. Uh, they're, not, they're no longer gonna go forward with that. It's been a, a, a pretty good loss for them and they're they're looking to, to change that. Uh, right now, today, um, tipping fee handling, what they call the handling fee, is $135 a ton. They have what they call a um, ACR, which is the average commodity revenue. It's what the recycling product is worth. Um, in February, when we, when we got the numbers from them, it was $39.33 a ton. So that reduces our cost from 135 ton down to 90, I think it's 94 ton. Um, today uh, at four o'clock, the ACR was $43 a ton. So it is trending on an upward scale. Um, how much up it'll go, that's a, that's a guess. So for budgeting purposes, I budgeted it at uh, 
$135 a ton on an average of 370 ton a year. So that bumps us up by $50,000 on tipping fees. I wouldn't chance uh, messing with the with that ACR number because it's it's a moving number. It goes up and down monthly. Um, I would like to think that it's going up. Um, the seller waste would like to think it's going up, but I think to be on the safe side, you need to budget for the $135 a ton and hope for the best. That increases the whole uh, um, recycling and trash budget by 58,000. I put 51 in there for a placeholder. Um, it came in at 51,810 for a number. Let's stop right there, Nate. Are there any questions thus far for Nate? Okay, I don't see any hands. Go right ahead, Nate. The CIP, the only thing I'm going to ask for an increase in the CIP is 50000 in the paving. Uh, this year's project is the sidewalk Main Street project which is going to consume our match on that is going to consume every dime of the paving money that I have available to this department. So I was asking for a one time up $50,000 increase in that so we can get started on next year's projects. Uh, and we've got a couple of small paving patch jobs that I like to get done and crack sealing that I'd like to get done this year. Um, the mowing contracts, I didn't cover that. Do you want to do that while I'm right on it? Go right ahead. The mowing contract is up this year. Uh, we negotiated a 2% increase. Um, that's going to push it up a little bit. The problem with the mowing contract is it's broke out into several different line items. So for my purposes, it goes up, one number goes up. Um, we added for the new sidewalks that are coming in, we have added to the Mountain Road and we've added to North Raymond Road. Um, that right now is up 2%, so the 62,451. It would take me a little while to rummage through where it's broke out into each department. It's spread out over, oh, geez, I think it's spread out over TIF, cemeteries, public works, town hall. And they all pay their equal fees or their, their portion of it. And if I can chime in on that part, what, what I ended up doing um, based on the 2% that Nathan gave me, I went ahead and um, did an increase overall to all the different line items uh, for the departments and areas that he mentioned. Okay. Nate, do you need any equipment? Any uh, we've got, well, no, we've got two trucks that have been ordered out of this year's operating budget. Um, they're coming for this coming winter. Uh, we're replacing uh, the 2014 F550. And we're, we actually, in the, in, the, in the deal with the town of Gray, uh, we ended up with a, a wheeler dump truck fully equipped plow gear on it, uh, which was lower mileage and a newer truck than what we bought for the Vermont truck. So we've got two Vermont trucks that are getting sold and we're replacing the 550. In 2022, uh, we're looking at either the rubber tire backhoe or one more dump truck. It would be a small one, but this, uh, my, Equipment line item is fine where it's at. Okay. Any other questions? I don't see any questions for Nate. Thank you very much for your time, gentlemen. And Lee. Thank you, Nate. Thank you. Let's go on to general assistance. I can speak to that. Um, so essentially, it's um, it's going to be flat funded. We're uh, not requesting any more. It's essentially eight thousand um, dollars. We get a seventy percent reimbursement uh, from the state, so it tends to be a rotating type of uh, amount. Uh, this year, um, we've managed to utilize those funds and continue to use the monies once we get reimbursed from the state. So. Um, in terms of revenue, um, for the revenue line would be fifty six hundred dollars, and the expense side of GA would be eight thousand. So no change there. 
the other thing I'd like to say is that we've been very fortunate to keep the community assistance fund alive and well, and we're getting contributions. So we always encourage people who would be inclined to, to send in, um, you know, funds that uh, would be tax deductible, I believe, for them to the town as a qualified nonprofit governmental entity. And we use those funds to help people who would be, you know, not qualified for GA. Uh, I guess we've sort of characterized them as the working poor. And so helping people who are struggling and that we do have a few people in that category. And so uh, any any funds in, that we receive in that area are most appreci appreciated. And we have got some significant contributions lately, which is really nice. Very good. Any questions for general assistance? Seeing none, community development. So community de development, I just wanted to, um, I believe that was a carryover item. Um, there was nothing listed as I started to look in deeper into uh, our chart of accounts. And so I believe that was a one-time project that may have been done um, last year. So uh, there was no, no, nothing in the budget uh, listed under that. All right, very good. So I couldn't find anything. Yeah, I'm, my apologies. <laughs> yeah, so I will say this. Um, I will be sending out to the board and the budget uh, finance committee that uh, update it um, with page numbers and any and any changes or corrections. Um, so we'll have a, a fresh uh, corrected book just to make sure everything, all the, all, that, um, all the T's are crossed and uh, I's are dotted. Yeah, I, I have found today some minor date issues and other things. And so this is our first year together. And so we're gonna be better next year, believe me. And uh, so, but I think Alex has done a really, really good job in a very short time on the job. And I know that all the department heads have worked closely with him, I have. And so uh, it'll be better next year, but we'll make it better this year before the, we get to the final, final iteration. Marshall. You're muted. Sue, can you unmute them? There you go. There we go. Thank you. Was the our value assigned to community development? No, there wasn't. And, and that, I guess that's what I wanted to ask too, is should we put something in there between Tasseltop and the playground, between Mill Street and the playground? Should we put something in there? You know, that's a great question. And I, what I've often wondered with community, community development, um, you know, when we were talking about TIF, and I think that that's part of community, community development uh, or economic development. And I'm not sh quite sure if that was the direction this was headed. Um, I don't have that, um, you know, historical foundation. So when I first saw community development, that's what I was under the impression that it was more economic development, but I could be wrong. Um, it could have totally been a different project. It could have been a grant. Um, so I, I, I mean, I, like, I know there was the food pantry grant that Kathy Goslin took the lead on um, and several other, the back, backpack program was another program that was, you know, that I saw in the chart of accounts. So I'm not quite sure, I mean, those are, definitely be an opportunity to discuss, you know, do we want to include um, some type of community development program for this upcoming fiscal year? Um, I would just like to comment the, the problem that we found, you know, with the revaluation of TIF, we found after Kathy's departure. So, you know, we hadn't thought of anything that way, but maybe, maybe that would be a placeholder. We could talk about it in a way to help us straighten out that problem. A couple of a couple of years ago, we put in $5,000 as a placeholder for uh, broadband, for uh, marketing and sales of a broadband, which never took place. And I think it's 2018 where that would appear first. I'm not sure that would come into um, this one, Alex, or... Yeah, I can certainly research um, and, and look that's, that up. That's at least two years old. Yeah. 
if that's the case, that probably can be dissolved. All right. Yeah, I can certainly research. We get, luckily we've had Trio for uh, you know three, four years now, and it allows me to um, do some comparisons as well as go back. So I can certainly uh, look that up and see if there was anything allocated for community development, and okay. you know how how we paid, um, you know what we paid for it. Kathy, just on Alex's comments, uh, the backpack program was hopefully just a one summer thing. We took donations from the town um, to do that. I hope we don't have to do it again this summer that the school will be in place to do it. But that was supposed to be just one summer. And as for the pantry grant, they got a $10,000 grant and we've had payments made directly to the food pantry. So it's not going through the town of Raymond at all. Oh, okay. That's good to know. Thanks, Kathy, for the clarification. Ralph? Yeah, I mean, uh, community development, we, a lot of the things that would quote unquote fall under there, uh, we end up putting into the over, over time, so things like the Hawthorne House and things like that. So uh, we, you know, we, it's not that we haven't looked at those, but we we found way, instead of having those as a standalone there, uh, brought those into TIF and areas like that so that that we were still doing things, but it was being picked up under a different, you know, different category. So when you look at that, you've got to kind of look at what, what some of those, some of those items were inside the TIF, because that's, that is where we covered some of those items. Mr. Bruno also had his hand up. Well, yes. Go ahead, Joe. Um, what was the name of the group that Sam and Wayne Holmquist started? Didn't we give money to them, like $5,000? No. No, that was uh, Raymond Revitalization, and the name has changed two or three times. And that was originally started by Wayne and, and uh, Sam. And as time has rolled on, that has been pretty much put in the back burner. But there never was any money set aside for that account. No, oh, I, I thought originally we had put $5,000 into it, but I could I be think, wrong. No, I'm I think old. that... I think that that goes back to my earlier comment about 5,000 was put into a, uh, for a meet and greet for the broadband rollout that never happened. And I, and I remember talking to Sam about that a couple of years ago, that we want to plug a hole in there for, for 5,000. And I think that, I think you'll find that that's where it is. That's where it is. Yes. Yeah. I do remember the same thing that we put some money into yes, it. That's correct. So, so maybe not being able to predict the future, we should put a zero placeholder in it and keep it. So I did, was I, I'm actually, I pulled up 2018 um, per Marshall's request and I do see that community uh, community development back in 2018, there was actually a salary line for $7,072 uh, ordinance line for community development for 5,000. That was not utilized. Uh, planning, uh, 26,500. Um, advertising, there was a $2,000 line. Um, Post 155 was under that as well. RTP and SMAA was under community development and we had a supply line. So there seems to be quite a few items in, at one point in 2018 for community development. Um, but there those, hasn't... Have been, those have been consolidated out into other areas. I see. Okay. And then that money goes to Bago Tech next to do community development. I think the seven thousand might have gone there, Joe. Yeah. Well, I believe also some of the uh, GIS went. Uh, yeah, it was picked up under you know it was community development money too. Yeah. So more than likely, it was uh, to Ralph's point, I think these have been sort of uh, distributed to other areas mm -hmm. within the budget. Agreed. Anything else on community development? We'll move on to public safety, animal control first. Who would like to, you're muted, Don. I noticed that Jessica Jackson was not present, so I called her she didn't have the link. I asked Sue to send it. Did that go? 
It, it did go, and I still haven't seen her sign in. So maybe we give her a little more time. I'll call and see what's going on again, if we could go on to Bruce. And Dawn, if she needs a, diff a different email, just email it to me, and I'll get the link out to that one. Okay, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Well, Bruce, look at you. You get to move ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Um, well, obviously, this has been a real interesting year, and I think our budget kind of reflects that um, pandemic and all. It's uh, impacting us in ways that we couldn't even have predicted a year ago at this point in time. And uh, despite all the quarantines and our people who have had it and our patients we've lost during it, um, we're trudging through. As um, far as the budget goes, <clears throat> We have a reflected uh, increase in our salaries line, which basically covers contractual agreements, uh, coverage so we can maintain our minimum coverage when someone's on vacation or on a sick out, things like that. We've adjusted a few of the other accounts accordingly. Um, there's an increase in the dispatch line because they continually go up 3% annually. Um, health and safety stays the same. We reduced our travel and training account on a one-time event for this year because we don't predict that we're going to really be out doing a lot of that big uh, classes in, in group sessions that cost a lot of money. So uh, we're just starting to now open up in-house and getting some of those trainings that we need done in-house. And of course, those are fairly reasonably priced. So. Um, we made a reduction in building maintenance by $1,000. We went up a little bit in vehicle maintenance because our vehicles are aging and costing a little more. Unfortunately, all our material costs have gone up. Um, as a general overview, like a $500 increase in gas and diesel, and I'm not quite sure at this point that might not be enough. I don't know what we're going to walk into. However, uh, you, you see what gas prices are doing out there in the field, and they're way higher than they were a year ago. Uh, let's keep our fingers crossed that it's enough at this point. We did make a small adjustment in fire prevention, basically because of cost of materials has gone up. Uh, backing up one line, we went up $1,000 in our SCBA or our self-contained breathing apparatus maintenance line because those air packs are now approaching the 12-year-old uh, mark and a lot of the electronics that, uh, unfortunately, everything has a computer in it and these things are integrated with computers mm -hmm. and we're having some experiencing some issues with those. When one of those breaks, it's automatically like, you know, five, $600 for a part. So they're not cheap uh, to maintain. Uh, we did go down in operational supplies by a thousand, but we had to adjust up a little bit in our supplies, our, our X supplies or prescription type, that's our medical line. Um, what we're finding, and, and again, I'm not sure that once we wrote this till now that we're gonna find that that is enough, we're hoping. Uh, we used to pay $9.60 or so per box of uh, non-latex medical gloves. It's 50 gloves or 25 a pair. Uh, we just had a price this week of, from one company uh, that we routinely use, $32 per box. And you can't buy many boxes at a time. Uh, medical supplies have gone through the roof. Um, I'm sure we can get them a little cheaper than 32 but I don't know how much cheaper we're going to get them. Uh, so these things are going to impact us in the next year, maybe beyond. Um, so overall, there's been a few ups and downs and just minor adjustments based on last year's experiences, past year's experiences and such. Uh, basically, we're at a 3% operational line increase total overall, just under that, but 3% rounded up. And um, we did put in a benefits package or request a benefits package to make one of our part-time positions two people who fill one full-time 48-hour, 24-hour, 24-hour shift into one full-time position so that we might have a better time filling it with a permanent position. As you see in the cover letter, we're having quite a few shifts that are still open. So we've had some luck getting applications um, at this point. We're, in, we're interviewing, and um, it, I, I believe that with that one position being full-time, that's going to be uh, a benefit to us to help fill these shifts. And to get buy-in with an employee rather than using per diems, et cetera, who, when a holiday comes around, guess what, where they want to be? Not here. Full-timers, they may put in for a vacation, but I can deny that if I have to. So we get people who work. On the operational budget, that's about uh, it in a brief overview, a uh, very brief overview. What's the total year-to-date increase? A total increase? 
for this coming budget is three it's two point eight percent, I do believe. Or dollar amount, please. Um uh, dollar amount forty some thousand, Alex. Am I uh, actually the the <clears throat> excuse me, budget uh over last year to the initial request is twenty thousand one seventy one increase. Yeah, it's twenty. Yeah, you're right. I just, just did it in my head here real quick. Yeah, no worries. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Goslin, Kevin Oliver has his hand up. Go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, thanks, guys. Hey, this question's for Bruce. Bruce, mm -hmm. uh, with regard to the SCBA line, yes. and you mentioning parts to repair them or keep them up to date are pretty high. Yes. Have you made any analysis of how many parts are required over the course of the year to keep these um, devices up? at these higher repair part prices versus potentially investing in new equipment, you know, new SCBAs. Yes. Um, I can tell you what the figures would be without telling you that I've done an actual research project on them. An air pack alone without a spare bottle is about $6,000. And an extra bottle is another thousand on top of that. Uh, they have a 15 year lifespan on bottles. You throw them away at the end of 15 years. So we have been slowly replacing them or buying new so that we kind of phase them in. We'll buy last year, I think we bought six bottles at the end of the year, uh, just so that we don't have all of a sudden 40 some odd air bottles to replace at once at almost a thousand dollars a pot. So given that, uh, there's also annual maintenance that has to be done. Every pack needs to be flow tested at $47 a pop. Every bottle needs to be hydro tested every three years. And I think that's 47 or $50 a pop. And we phase those things in as well on the bottles because there are three year rotations. The packs are an annual thing. Uh, then you add in the normal uh, maintenance on the packs and uh, it, it's pricey, but I think overall we did a grant um, 12 years ago, we replaced all of our air packs. And I want to say the packs alone were 100 and bottles were 148,000 back then. So buying new, new, uh, at some point, yes, we'll have to do that. And I would like to try the grant route again and do them all at once. Um, it creates its own set of problems. Obviously all your bottles need to be replaced in 15 years and all your packs are exactly 15 years old. They all experience the same breaking issues at the same point in time. So I don't know if that makes it a little bit clearer or did I make it clear as mud for you? Yeah, Bruce, if you can hear me, there no, that's, that's great information. And I appreciate you sharing that. The reason why I was asking the question is, you know, in my background in, um, you know, power plant maintenance, we have to look at the cost of repair parts over, a five-year plan or an annual plan versus, um, you know, planning and budgeting for investment in new equipment. So um, I appreciate that. And I just, you know, was coming at that question from a point of, you know, how are we looking at our annual Correct. spare parts cost versus should we be budgeting for a rotation of new equipment over time? Right. And so that's that combination of we, we do a little bit of each. And um, so you see that out of that, a lot of our costs are really in annual required maintenance. And then you have the spike of the uh, broken part maintenance that unfortunately just puts us over the top a lot of times. But yet it isn't enough to say, hey, let's run out and grab all you know new air packs this year. Not yet. Uh, we do a lot of our repairs in-house, a fair amount of them, and actually we have a class for five of our people coming up where they will be technicians and certified by Scott Air Packs to do uh, more advanced repairs in-house. So that's going to help control that cost a little bit. It's just something that we try to do when we can is find ways around sending stuff out, doing it in-house. Bruce, I'm sorry, Joe. Yes. Thank you. Bruce, ha has the fire department been involved with vaccinations in Raymond? I mean, there's an EMS program that you can get vaccine and do vaccinations for seniors. We looked at doing that, Joe. Um, I think part of the problem that we ran into, and Kathy can jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a big piece of that was one was the medical control component of it. Uh, that was number one. And uh, number two was, is trying to get enough staffing to be able to cover our calls and man our station, et cetera, with, with what we need for the basics. 
and go out and do some of these uh, clinics as well. So we'd be looking at quite a, an increase trying to do that in a separate location. Um, even if it was a drive through at the station, we'd need specific dedicated personnel for that aside from our responder personnel. So those are kind of a couple of the hindrances that we found and not to throw a roadblock up to it, but we have talked about it. It's something we're still chatting about. Um, I know Kathy's had some dialogue with medical control with uh, Mania Mass on it, and we were chatting about getting Dr. Uh, Wilkins on board with us. Well, just so you know, we have done, or I personally have done quite a few vaccinations and worked with fire departments around the state yep. to do vaccine clinics. So. I'm available if you need me, just so you know. Uh, we, we did it with Walderboro. We did it up in Cornish. We did quite a few of them. I personally have done almost 4,000 vaccinations already myself. So I'm available if you need me. Great, great. Joe, part of it is um, Wyndham and, and Raymond, we're going to work with Gorham. Gorham's been heading up a lot of them. So some of our staff are going over there to help. Um, in doing some of the community ones. But as the chief said, um, we don't have a medical director right now that wants to sign off on us doing it. So we're dead in the water until we get that. All right, Bruce. Capital. Well, I see a, a column here, emergency management. Oh yeah, yeah, I didn't, I, mean, I got a note right here for it. So um, I wanted to cover that in my opening comments, sorry. Um, we did file one initial uh, claim with FEMA. Uh, what we qualified for at that time was what was on, on the list was $15,000 qualified at 100% reimbursement. That had been filed for, all that paperwork is authorized, signed for, and we should be seeing some monies coming shortly. Of course, a change of administration, number one, put a delay on things. Uh, they changed the methodology. Uh, the monies used to go from FEMA to us, from FEMA to a state. The state would then reimburse us. They took the state out of the link. So our check, when we do get it, will now just be direct from FEMA at 100%, um, opposed to the 10% match that we usually have. So only $15,000 out of our first batch actually qualified under the FEMA guidelines um, this was a new thing for us uh, to do this, this reimbursement this year. Normally it's, you know, a bunch of trees fall down, a bunch of roads wash out. Nathan and I get together, I look at their expenses, we compile everything. He's got all his figures for tonnage, for chipping, for hauling, for, and we just add it all up and put figures with it. And those things are obviously covered under most of those FEMA declarations. Being a medical and purely a medical claim, um, this was a learning experience and a learning curve and FEMA all of a sudden changed their minds on a few things and we had to be very creative as to how we worded uh, the proposals when we put them in. And in so we were able to cover a couple of additional things that they automatically wrote off for me. Uh, they said, no, we won't cover those barriers, we won't cover this, we won't cover that. Like, but it's necessary. It's part of our command structure to protect them and things like that. So we got those things covered, um, a lot of them. So 15,000 out of the first batch and the second batch, we're just getting ready right now to uh, compile another, re uh, another request and put it in. We have to also be kind of careful because you have to have $3,800 to qualify as a project with FEMA. So we have to make sure we have $3,800 of stuff that's going to qualify and they aren't going to cut it back. Uh, in order to put in for it. So we're at that point now again, and uh, we're, gonna, we're starting to submit it and look a little bit more in detail. This time we have some personnel costs that we can put in for. So, uh, bottom line is 15,000 was put in for, it's what we qualified for, and 100% of that, or the whole 15,000, will come back to the town of Raymond. We expect it in four weeks. And if I can just state um, so far, in uh, emergency management. We didn't have anything budgeted for this year. Uh, we have about $14,600 and 14 cents of expenses. Um, a ma majority of that um, w related to the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, sounds about right. On the issue of the pandemic, it would look as though with the latest, uh, the, the new Biden plan for 
distributing some economic aid to municipalities that we might see around four hundred fifty thousand dollars. How that'll be allocated, distributed, I'm not sure, but so that's that will be forthcoming. Yeah, I'm not sure of the details on that one yet either. So yeah, we don't have any information it for that reason. <laughs> we were asked to put together some proposed projects and and you know ideas and so forth, but I, I don't know how the state's going to administer that yet. I do have a question. Um, I know we didn't budget, and it looks like historically we haven't budgeted for emergency management. Is that something that we generally utilize, allocate, and then apply for grants, Bruce? Yeah, it's yeah, that's what it's called too, as a grant. The reimbursement is called a grant in the end uh, once they declare an incident. Uh, we haven't traditionally put in for anything because the fire department's generally where it kind of falls, if you will, even though. I say most of the time it's it's really public works that has the biggest expense in most of these, except this time. I see. Uh, this is that anomaly. So we just generally run it through the normal budgets and then re reimburse that later. Um, unfortunately, there are times when that reimbursement comes back two years later. It, it moves at a slower speed than municipal government when you deal with the feds. So. I see. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I don't see any other questions. Bruce, would you like to move on to CIP? Yeah, yeah, I would. Um, thank you. Um, this year, what we did from our, our monies that we already have in CIP is put in for an allocation of $47,000 to purchase a uh, hybrid uh, Explorer, Ford Explorer, as a chief vehicle, um, and then use the Tahoe that we have, uh, which is still in good shape as a hand-me-down vehicle, if you will, but to the deputy chief for use. Um, she's been using one of the pickup trucks that we have. Um, the pickup truck that she's using oftentimes is needed to haul a trailer to a, for a spill or a forestry incident or an ATV type incident. And um, we really want to kind of get those pickups back in the rotation 100% for responses, etc. Uh, and give her a vehicle that's more suitable as a, as a chief or a command vehicle. So that's what the proposal is. Uh, for this year's money, <clears throat> it doesn't require any more. It's just the average or the, the annual $75,000 that's put into our equipment line, uh, which this would come out of. And then uh, in 2022-23, you'll see there's a rather large number there. And we've been reevaluating our deployment, our assets, our needs, the town's needs, and our abilities. And we looked at it and said, we really have a couple trucks that are due for replacement and we ought to be looking at this as a combination. So what we're, we're doing right now is we're, we're specking out and having engineered the, a, a preliminary plan, if you will, uh, to put a rescue pumper together. And this would take the place of the utility seven or the mini pumper that we have, which is 22 plus years old and starting to cost us a lot in maintenance and the uh, heavy rescue truck and combine them into one. Um, one of the biggest issues we looked at is that we're a smaller group now and our capabilities are, are lower. Uh, the mini pumper for a fire attack truck is really not great. It has a limited amount of water on it, 250 gallons. Once you pull both hose lines that are on it, you only have 125 gallons left to push that water out. So while it's act a great truck to access some of these confined and narrow roads, et cetera, really isn't a great truck to fight a fire with and has been kind of a hindrance. Uh, so we're looking at that and the grand picture is try to eliminate two trucks with the purchase of one that will be a 2022 20, year, 25 year, if we can make it go that long asset. Uh, but that's a year out. So we're not asking for any extra money for that right now. We just wanted to mention it, bring, put it out there and let you know that we are working on it and we've got, uh, engineers from the different companies trying to put together our specific needs, this equipment in this basket needs to fit into that new vehicle. Uh, unfortunately, it's two vehicles in one. So there's a lot more consideration there as to how to make this work and work right for us. Um, but that's it in a nutshell for CIP. Other than that, it's the normal every year uh, contribution, if you will, or appropriation of 75,000. The next vehicle after that's a rescue and that's 23, 24 that's out there and no, no extra is being added to that right yet either. Any questions for Bruce?
I don't see any, Bruce. Huh. All right, thank you. Thank you. I got a question for Alex. On the capital improvements, you zeroed out account 901500 and moved everything to 91501. Yeah. So essentially the way it works, um, each account, because this is an expense account, and the, this is what I gather. This is something that Kathy had done, um, and I think it's a trio system process. So essentially what would have happened when these accounts – she, she created essentially a new account and the balances that carry forward with capital improvements, she moved those balances into the 911501. So one of the questions that I have for um, for TRIO is, is that something that has to happen every year or can we just keep the same account, add to it rather than continue to create another new account? And I checked the numbers and that was essentially what happened and you can see that with 901500 and you look at each sub um sub account um the budget was like for instance 2021 it was 215 the year to date was 215 so it essentially just zeroed itself out but what she had done is carried over the remaining balance of what was not used in that fiscal year because obviously with with capital improvements it is a carry over um so yeah, it was rather interesting when I saw that why it was be, it was being done that way. But based on what I've seen with this system, uh, essentially that's how it's working. Hopefully, Great, I you. won't have to do that again. <laughs> Hopefully, we can keep it the same. Great question. Uh, I see Jessica's with us now. You want to move on to animal control? Can people hear me? <laughs> yes. Can you ask Jessica? So, oh, there she is. I'm here. Hello, Jessica. Can Second. you give us? Can you introduce yourself and give us a brief description of your budget? Sure. I don't even have a copy of my budget with me, honestly. So Jessica, just so you know, um, did not receive the link. So I called her and yeah, this we is a we rapidly <laughs> set this up. Mm -hmm. I'm actually trying to pull something up right now here. Jesse, are you the one that did your budget or did you somebody else do it? Uh, we do it together as a group. So there's not, there's not much of a change. Um, Who's the group that you do it with? I'm sorry. The three town managers. Okay. Yeah. All right. So if I can, Bob, ask a question. Go ahead. All right. Um, I guess watching last year's meeting... Can you explain, and I know the town managers were having you write up what your job description is. Um, if you can um, let us know how it works with the assistant. Um, okay. Because last year's description was just to fill in on those calls just so you could get a break. And I'm not finding that to work. Okay. Sorry, my dog's whining, sorry. So my understanding was that we went into a full-time regional position with the animal control department. So in order for me to be full-time, I'd have to work 40 hour position um, to have those benefits. Am I correct? Correct. Yeah. So I oh, wouldn't, be able, I wouldn't be able to, hold on. I uh, wouldn't be able to, can I speak? I wouldn't be able to respond 24 hours a day. So we had to get those calls into, um, you know, somewhat of a, a blocks of, of time. And, and the way that we found that to work would to be give me, you know, some general operating hours, uh, which would best fit the needs of the community and allow them to have access to me and, and to the department uh, at, at reasonable times of day. 
Um, and then still offer under emergency situations access to an animal control officer during the off times. Okay, so so what you're saying, I guess I guess what happened last year is on your explanation was that there would be access to a part time person is what it is. And what I'm finding out now, just because I was in that situation with the dog, um, is that the only the part time person cannot leave the station unless it's an emergency. And when you've got a dog running around on 302, to me, that's an emergency. So I'm trying to figure out where where the miscommunication is. So the dog was no longer running on 302. If the dog, if it was called in and it was a traffic hazard, then the animal control officer would have gone out and stopped the traffic hazard. There was three families out there, and I was one of them. Okay. So the but other when the thing, call, when the call was, if, go ahead. When the call was called in, we were not given access to speak with the complainant. You never answered the phone for the assistant. You did not answer the phone for the supervisor. I wasn't even on that day. We had no access to you. The call was called in from dispatch to us, but before it was even called in to us from dispatch, we already had a call to my private cell phone on my day off by public works director. So we both tried to reach out to you and neither one of us was able to offer you a solution or tell you what we could give you for a response. So I don't think it's fair for you to tell us that we couldn't, that we didn't do anything when you didn't even offer us the chance to do something. Okay, I'm going to respond to that because I had talked to a Wyndham but police I think officer. This... Wait, just okay. wait, my yep. turn. Because I'm the one that stopped what I was going to do the dog. <laughs> and, and what happens is you didn't call me until later. We did. We thought we had a person. The person at Gret at um, Naples said they were not allowed to leave the building unless it's an emergency. Um, Cumberland County Dispatch did call us back. So I don't to tell. And I'm standing there, and I'm the and and I'm the person that was dealing with Cumberland County. I'm the one that was dealing with the Wyndham Police Department. So to say that the, some of this stuff happened. It did not. So the Wyndham Police Department wouldn't have had a part in it. I believe who you think you were talking to through Cumberland County was actually me who did respond to you immediately. No. Accurate records of everything, and I can actually bring them to you and show you all of it because I was afraid like something like this would happen. So I kept all of those reports. Okay. So Lynn did make an attempt to call you. I made an attempt to call you. I, in fact, I made an attempt to call you as soon as dispatch paged me, and sometimes there's a 20-minute delay. Right now, we're working on an hour delay through dispatch through the Cumberland County communication system right now because we're so backed up on those calls. Okay, and that's that's not something that I can do. And and I did offer response even though I wasn't even on duty. So I'm sorry that I got to you late, but I wasn't even in town. I know that. So my question is, who is the and backup she wasn't, person? She wasn't what at is a their station. job duties that we are paying for somebody to do is what I'm asking. To answer to priority calls on an emergency basis. And if you want somebody to answer to all calls, then you need to put more money in the budget. Whoa. Animal control officer to be on duty. So, can I, can so I wait, 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 one second. So a dog on 302 is not considered an emergency. So what is considered an emergency is what I'd like to know. Why are you yelling at me? Because I am like, this absolutely. This is inappropriate. I'm not going to be abused by you. Seriously? Yes. Somebody else ask her the questions okay, then. It's my turn, please. Thank you. Can you tell me, you're servicing three towns. I am. For 40 hours a week. Yes. No, so that's, that's you're giving the Don of Raymond 13 hours a week to control all the animals in the Don of Raymond. No. No, why why is that a no? I am on call from 12 from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. five days a week. I am How can that be? Paid, How can that I'm be? Uh, hold on a second. I'm only paid 40 hours. Okay, and not only that, but I supervise another another person on that job from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. 
because we pay somebody $13 an hour to respond to priority calls who has to work under emergency situations with the sheriff's department, okay, and irrational people on the side of the road who aren't properly trained to know what they're doing because of the low rate of pay. And I have to, resp I have to help them with that, okay, and then cover on the weekend and make up what they're doing. Okay, the other, the other issue happening, I have with this concept is I understand. I can explain to you what's going on. So what no, happened? No, 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 I want to change the subject here. The, I'm under the impression that the only responsibility the animal control officer has is domesticated animals. Is that correct? No. Then what do you do with the fox that's running through my backyard? Well, it's wild. I mean, it's supposed to be running through your backyard. Um, I'm done. Thank you very much. Okay. Rolf. Yeah, I've got a question on the <clears throat> vehicle and maintenance. Uh, we're going from $500 up to $4,500. The $4,500 really isn't $4,500. It's thirteen thousand five hundred. So, exactly. where's where's the what's happening on the vehicle side that we're seeing that big of a jump? We're looking at the I'll replacement. Tell you on maintenance. Go ahead. I was just saying I don't I can't answer to the maintenance. That would be a Nathan thing. Hey, Don, can you answer it? Yeah, we're looking at the capital replacement of the vehicle if possible is one issue. And the car is now roughly 140, 50,000 miles in that range. I don't know how many idle hours it has on it, but thousands of idle hours. So maybe Nathan could comment on the general condition of the car, but but I think we're, we're looking to find a replacement vehicle. The total condition of the car was pretty good. I haven't got the bill out for the last service on it. Um, it does have, it's coming on to the 150,000 mile mark. I wouldn't be too concerned about the idle hours on it. But the, I think we get in closer to 175, 200,000, we should start looking at a car. That's what we're doing. We're, we're not going to say we're going to buy one tomorrow, but we want to be no. ready if we have to. Yeah, but wouldn't that, wouldn't that then fall under CIP? CIP. It would, yeah. Yeah, so... I mean, so, so the main, overstated, main, we're overstated there, understated in CIP. But if we bring it, if, if we if we bring that back and put the put the money, in, you know, take the money out of the CIP, then we better control it. But then it begs the further question of who actually owns the vehicle if this agreement falls apart at some point. Right now, Rolf, the car is owned by the town of Raymond. It's registered and owned by the town of Raymond. We purchased it and divided the cost of it out over the three towns. We paid a third, Naples paid a third, and Raymond uh, Casco paid a third. I would assume that that would continue forward. Uh, if we purchased another vehicle, we would buy another vehicle. Uh, the town of Raymond would, and then oh, we, we put it out over the, the other two towns. Um, That's right, Dave. <laughs> I would think if this plan fell apart, the car would come back to the Raymond municipality. It's our car. Any other questions for Jessica? Um, I would like to try to finish explaining how my position, my full-time position works, if I could have that opportunity. Sure. Okay. So, so what would happen? Because right now, um, I don't have a backup. So I am working my full-time position and nights and weekends and responding to everything on my own. But, but typically what we would have happen, and I'm sorry, I thought my camera was on here, so I apologize about that. But whatever is not an emergency and we would respond to the following day is tacked on to any free time that people, you know, that I would have the given day, the following business day. Um, I, I don't believe that many people understand exactly what my job entails there's a lot more to that it than just going out and picking up stray dogs uh there's a, a lot of reports there's a lot of court there's a lot of um community counseling that goes into it 
I've taken a lot of proactive steps in our community to keep down the amount of noise that goes on. And that is why we do not have a lot of problems in our areas. Um, I've built a strong connection with our community members and most of them, if you ask, are happy to have us. And over the three years that we've been doing it this way, we have not had any complaints other than this one uh, brought to us about doing it in this manner. We, we haven't had a situation yet. Um, so overall, people have been pleased with the way it's been working and, and the response that they're getting because they do get a response almost immediately by someone. Um, yeah. And, I, you know. Good, Don. I want to go back to Marshall's question. I'm supposing he might have been asking about a, like a rabbit fox or some kind of a, you know, animal that was a threatening animal, that was a wild animal. What would your role be? Um, if it was threatening somebody, then, uh, you know, I would stop the threat and I would notify the wardens. And because I'm duly trained and I have multiple licenses, the wardens in our area would allow me to do more than what an, um, a singly licensed animal control officer would do. And I would be able to control the threats. Um, the wardens in our area also ask me to help them with um, some animal exclusions and stuff like that as well. Um, but as far as like rabies threats, animal control officers are responsible to do that. And if a warden is tied up and they're under state law, it, it states clearly that if somebody else is not dealing with it, we are to deal with it. Now, if it's, you know, something like a woodchuck that's digging somebody's garden, that, that's not our problem. But if it is a public safety issue, then by all means. Mr. Bruno also had a question. Bob? Yes, go ahead, Bruce. Uh, Joe, sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Jessica, is, is your position a salaried position or are you paid hourly? I'm paid hourly. So if you work more than 40 hours, you get paid for more than 40 hours. Um, right now, if I, pay, if I work over, that's hard to say. I'm not on my 12 hour days. I'm not asking for anything more than my eight hours. I'm making myself available from 6am to 6pm. I'm in uniform and ready to respond because if Mr. Bruno picked up a dog the night before, I want to be ready at 6am to be able to pick that dog up before he goes to work and bring it to the animal shelter. First thing in the morning. If, if somebody doesn't get home until five o'clock in the evening and I need to do a kennel inspection, I do not want them to have to wait. I do not want them to have to miss work. I can meet them after five and do their kennel inspection when they arrive home. So I can work until six and go in an hour later that day. Do you see what I mean? So I can, I can. Yeah, so you're flexible with your 40 so hours. I can, flex that, I can flex that, yes, but I'm always available. So should I wake up in the morning and dispatch gives me a call at 6.15, I go out and that's when my day starts, you know? So, uh, because it's, it is, it's public safety. You don't, I can't plan that a call will come in at eight or three or. Oh, I understand all that. I, I just yeah. want to make sure that we're following labor laws. Mm -hmm. If you're not salaried, that you get paid for every hour you work. Right. Yeah. That's and we have, we have the assistant who is asked for a hundred dollars a week to stay in town all night and all weekend, you know, and then $13 an hour to go out on a call, you know, and to ask, it, it's just, it's to wake up in the middle of the night, you know, for a dog at large that is contained and safe in somebody's home. We're going to be hard pressed to find somebody to do that for that kind of money. You know, that's why I'm not trying to be rude, but we're going to have to put more money into somebody for that, to do that. That's well, like I said, yeah. I am concerned about following labor laws. And right. Dawn, if you can explain it to me, how is she salaried or is she hourly? I'm well, hourly. I, my, my belief, because the pay end of it and the benefits are administered by the town of Casco, but my belief is that you're a salaried employee. You're paid the same amount of money on, an, on a week basis, correct? No, I'm paid hourly. If I could just pipe in, so based on the uh, ACO budget 21-22 draft that was sent forward to me, um, there is 
30 hours allocated for overtime. So it leads me to believe that the position is a uh, 40 hour uh, non-exempt position. I'm hourly. Yeah. yeah, I know what I am. But I'm, 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 with Joe, I'm with Joe Bruno. I'm thinking, you know what you are and Casco's administering it that way, but I'm not sure that's the way it should be done. Right. right. So what I would ask is, you know, um, for the HR representative from Casco to really do a, a study on the position and determine, uh, does it fall into what the um, federal government would determine as being an exempt position based on the responsibilities? I think before we even go that far, I'd like to see the contract from the ACO that tells me that she's 40 hours. Okay. Where's the contract? Well, I, I think the labor laws are pretty clear. You know, if you supervise people and you have freedom and flexibility, you're a salaried employee. Right. Unless you're punching the clock and getting paid time and a half for anything over 40 hours, then you're an hourly employee. Right. That's pretty I clear. Submit, I, submit a time, I submit a time sheet, sheet weekly with the lunch taken out and all that, you know, so, yeah. Well, Don, I would suggest that you get together with um, whoever the town manager is in, in Casco right now and, and figure out, is this a salary position or not, just so you abide by the labor laws. Yeah, my, my belief and position is that it is, and it should be administered that way. And I'm, so I'll talk to Don Garish. Again, I put a request. Let's take a look at the contract, please. Any other questions for Jessica? Thank you, Jessica. Very welcome. Oh, oh, can I mention something too? Go right ahead. Started an emergency uh, dog food campaign. So if we have anybody in need in the community who's fallen on hard times, if we know somebody who's had a house fire or whatnot um, in any of the surrounding communities, uh, I do have surpluses that have begun to be donated to us to help with that. So, um, and then what we do is we hook them up with some long-term help that way. Okay. So if anybody knows any help like that, we've, we've got that rolling too. All right. Thank you, Jessica. You're welcome. Bye. Have a good night, guys. Have a good night. You too. Kevin. Okay. Uh, hard to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> you um, can do it. It'll get worse, Kevin. It'll get worse. <laughs> uh, if everybody's looking at the budget uh, that I sent out in the uh, explanation sheet, you can see the errors. Uh, you can start with uh, infrastructure, server, hardware. We've this is the first time we've actually bumped up any of these things in years, uh, but we are incurring some more costs in most of our categories. Um, I tried to provide <clears throat> enough information here so that everybody would have, you know, a good look at what we're supporting, uh, especially with the network diagram. You can see uh, the network and all the different devices, the counts of the things that we have to support. And a lot of those things uh, are growing older. Uh, what we try to do is on the servers, we try to get um, eight to 10 years at least out of a server versus the five to six years we get out of a PC because they're obviously built much better. But as that goes, we have a lot of uh, replacement costs on the drives. Those drives run hard uh, 24 seven, 365. So we have quite a bit of cost on those drives. So that's where the big bump was in the server hardware. Software costs go up yearly uh, vendors you know just keep doing that as a normal uh, function nothing ever gets cheaper unfortunately yeah since the 3220 that bumped up a couple of thousand too i think uh, get down through look at the infrastructure network hardware that pretty much is almost the same uh, what we tend to do is a lot of new locks and stuff have come in over the last year uh, we haven't had any failures, but those locks are extremely expensive. They're networked, they're controlled from a centralized point. We update, we can gather information off them, who goes in. Nathan, uh, you know, every now and then gives me a query, who went into the town office at this hour? I get on, a couple minutes later, I tell them, you know, who entered at this point in time. So we have a pretty good security system with the locks. 
and the video security cameras now we're rolling out to all the locations. And so that was another server increase for last year. Uh, by the end of this year, we should have at least one camera at every location, if not multiple. Uh, for instance, the town office we have, I think, uh, eight cameras at the fire station. We have like uh, 14 or 16 cameras. So we're, we're doing pretty good with the security cameras. And we use those quite often to, to resolve conflicts and, uh, you know, uh, issues of people stealing stuff and things like that. Um, the infrastructure network software, uh, again, firewalls, they, you know, we have a lot of firewalls. And that's one of the issues that in the uh, CIP, we're trying to get to a point where we have a single um, point of entrance into the internet. Right now, every building goes to the internet, so we're incurring a cost of at least $100 a month per building uh, to get spectrum service. We'd like to get our fiber backbone in place, which will have a lot of things, uh, uh, advantages, which we can well address later in the presentation here. But uh, the, those costs go up every year. Um, Spectrum is, like I said, pretty expensive. Um, go down through here. We got the department hardware, and you can see the endpoints. Uh, that's again, we've got 68 PCs in the town of Raymond in the uh, municipal infrastructure that we're supporting. Uh, we've got 50 voice over IP phones. Um, it's all pretty boring stuff, but it is amazing. I had Eric, Eric go through and actually do all of the counts of these things, and we were quite surprised at the actual number of devices that we have to support. Um, you can see the department software, all the things involved in that. That went up a little bit too. The biggest thing in that is we're looking at uh, a docu document management system. In the town of Raymond, uh, in between all the different departments, we have well over 100,000 paper documents that people use reference on a daily basis that are not digitally backed up, that are not backed up in any manner. So there's several points that, that you know, that get addressed by this document management system that we'd like to put in, and that's somewhere between five and $6,000 a year. All documents will be scanned, um, which is a, a big project but not just scanned and saved and saved off site so that in cases of fire or uh, some disaster, they'll be you know, intact, but they'll be scanned and uh, the OCR, which is optical character recognition and metadata applied. So if you have an invoice, there'll be a template created for that invoice. All information will be pulled out of that. So if somebody sitting at a desk wants to do a query, they do a query, they don't have to go look in a filing cabinet, that, inf that information will come up immediately on their computer. Additionally, across departments, once you start doing this, if you're looking for some information from a, for a specific person about his lot or his tax payments, you can do a scan on that person and all the department's information will then come to your screen about that and you can, print those out, you can email them to that person. So it makes the management of information so much easier and the office so much more efficient and allows people to free up time to do things other than going to paper you know, documents and trying to figure out what's going on. And it, it definitely will pay for itself over the long run. So that that's the biggest, uh, add to uh, 3211, which is $17,000 this year. Uh, last year, I think it was uh, 10,600. Uh, let's see, nothing uh, exceptional on the other ones. Uh, we're asking for an increase on the 3115 salaries of $5,000. It's been um, many, many years since actually, we never ever had an increase from the first time that we started supporting the town. And we're asking for a $5,000 bump because as you can see, the number of things have grown incrementally uh, larger that we have to support. And we're spending, the three of us are spending a lot of time, you know, trying to support the town the best we can. And so we're asking for that $5,000 increase in salary. 
Uh, do you have any question on the operational budget? I like the way you broke it down in your description. Very informative. Well, I tried to provide much information so that anybody with a, you know, whether or not they were technical or not could, you know, really get a good look at what we do. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that you know, a lot of people like Sue really appreciate the things we do because she knows all the things she calls us for and, and the people that we deal with know that too. But it's nice to see that in one place that everybody can take a look at it. Uh, normally, you'd have a technical support person that only does network support, but we do the locks, the security cameras, you know, a lot of stuff that's rolled into what we, we do for the town, so. Um. Uh, Mr. Chair, could I make a comment? Go right ahead, Sue. I'd, I'd like to give an example of what Kevin and his crew, and actually I think just Kevin did, did this particular one. Um, <clears throat> last week when we suddenly had to close the town office, within, it seemed like just a few minutes, he had set up a schedule on our phones to uh, from 8.30 to 4, Tuesday through Friday, forward five of the office phones to my home phone and forward all of their messages to my email. So that's the level of technology that, that he's maintaining right now is the ability to do things like that literally on the fly. And that's small beans compared to a lot of the other things that he's been doing. Which is kind of a nice thing that we try to do too, because we try to bring in open, so that's all our phone system, other than the hardware, doesn't cost us anything. The operating system is all open source and it happens to be more flexible than most of the proprietary systems, which allowed me to, and I can just, I can look up on my screen up here right now and I can see all the phones in, in the Raymond system, whether they're up or down. I can configure them instantly. So it's, you know, we, we try to do the best we can to centralize control, make it easy and utilize open source to reduce the costs. I mean, that's our main goal. Um, anything else on the operational, Joe? Joe. Just refresh my memory. Is this still a contract that we have with your company, Kevin? Yes, that is. Well, so when you say you, you're trying to increase salaries, who is that affecting? Well, it's that's the salary line, but that's the company, that's the payment to the company, Woodbury Consulting. Actually, it's not a salary line, it's, co it's the contract line. Okay, well, it's, okay, it's on my sheet. I mean, yeah, on your side, uh, I, I understand that. We've, yeah. I mean, when he's looking at it, where is it coming up? It's right. on that contract line, Joe. You know, it goes from 80000 85000 but, yeah, what we, but is the contract in place or is it being renegotiated? How, how does that all work? I mean, you know, how, how do you take a contract that you have for a certain amount of money and say, we're just going to increase it this year? Well, I'd like to re obviously renegotiate it for, for that. I mean, we did that when we took over the um, IPTV support. We, we were at 60,000 at that point, and then we upped that to 80,000 to take over the support for the cable channel. Um, so I think that was a renegotiation yeah, add on we, at that point. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I was trying to get an answer to the earlier thing, which I do have some information on for later, but um, I would tell you that Kevin has been doing this job for a, a long time. And uh, as a contract employee, we renegotiate, we have major you know, changes and when we have expirations and so forth. And so I would advocate for the, you know, change. Nothing in life stays completely flat forever. And, you know, if I, it, I probably, if I were going to do the contract, I, I probably would have asked for money previous to this for, for additional, you know, compensation to reflect the cost of doing business, the cost of, you know, everything increases over time. So, but he has held it flat for a number of years. I can't say how many. He probably yeah. Joe, you remember when you had somebody take a look at it, uh, we came in about $100,000 less than the nearest competitor. Uh, Kevin, believe me, you guys are really good at what you do. I'm not questioning that one bit. You guys earn every penny that you do. You do a great job. But I, I'm just trying to make sure that we have, if we have a contract in place, then you have to modify the contract and you know yeah. make sure that that contract is up to date and all that. That's all I'm saying. I'm not questioning anything other than making sure everything's in place. Right. We th that's absolutely correct and true. And I think what's a little difficult here is this is it's a contract. It's a contract employee. 
but it's Kevin who started as a volunteer and has been with us for, I've been here 20 years. Kevin's been here more than 20 years. Since so, 1996. Since 1996. So I apologize and it's probably, possibly my error. Maybe I should have, uh, you know, taken the lead on that. And, uh, but he, he attends our department head meetings like a department head. He's integral to the operation as Sue was indicating when we have a crisis, an emergency. I mean, we, we switched him to a contractor. That's what he is. That's how he's paid. I don't think it's unreasonable for him to seek a change in compensation. He probably shouldn't be presenting it though. Yeah, it that's, be, uh, I mean, I don't know how- Some of test town staff member presents I mean, it's it. not my budget. I just have to explain. I understand. You should, you should probably, yeah. You muted, Joe. There, really love the Zoom stuff. <laughs> uh, I'm just saying that if he's presenting the budget and is asking for an increase, but he's really a contract employee, that increase should be coming from the town manager who should be presenting the technology budget with Kevin providing support as to why the increases are needed. That's all I'm saying. I am not questioning Kevin uh, and I, one and I'm bit. Not uh, I don't disagree with you at all, Joe. What he does. <laughs> uh, and I'm not disagreeing with you either at all. And uh, we'll see what we can do next year. The problem with me trying, or Alex or anybody else in this town, trying to present the intricacies of the technology budget is we'll have to work on that issue. Who does the uh, um, assessing budget? Well, we had we had Kurt here to talk about that. So, I mean, I think we have a, a structural change. We have to look at a way to improve what we're doing here. So, but I think where we run into the problem is when we talk about the compensation change, I think explaining some of the technological, you know, upgrades and things like that, I th and things that we're planning to do as a town is one thing, but I would agree with Joe. I mean, you shouldn't be presenting a contract change and we'll, we'll see what we can do about that. But I think it's new territory. So, yeah, I mean. It is new territory space. because we haven't had a change in the contract. Exactly. Based compensation for a, yep. a long time. I mixed. mean, we, we had the last major change we had was when, it, when they took over the broadcast studio. So Kevin talks about everything else and Don, you talk about a salary. Well, right. And I, I've, I've talked to Kevin in the past about, about the idea of, you know, the compensation and you know, so he held it for a number of years. We, we, it's not that we haven't had this conversation as we've had renewals. And so I guess we didn't handle it particularly well and I'm agreeing with Joe and we'll handle it differently moving forward. Ralph. Uh, yes, the, the comment I would have is in regards to software and things like that. We, uh, I thought we hit, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I was thinking that we wanted to do that, but would make sense to me that on the software issues and the new you know programs and things like that instead of getting picked up per se under the department levels they get picked up under the overall technology budget i mean it's it's more of a you know more of an accounting thing but that way you get you know instead we're seeing you know we're see, you're seeing software and things like that there but we're also seeing it coming up in, in other departments and whatnot so from a, from a standpoint of being able to look at it from an overall standpoint of where are we on software and things like that, it'd be nice to see that all brought back into that one area so that we can see where that's actually going year to year because we've got some, you know, there's, there's some that exists in Bruce's budget, there's some that exists in Alex's budget, there's some that exists here and there. And so when we look at this, we see a line that says software and, and things like that, but it's not the full picture. So, right, I, that Alex and I had been talking about that, trying to, because a lot of places uh, dispense all of their technology to the department and cost cost it out to a single each department. I, I, on the other hand, agree with what you're saying, Rolf. Is um, I like to see the overall cost of all of the technology in one place, 
and it's it's not really that's not it's, that it's my budget because it's not I'm just a contractor but you can see where everything related to technology is falling and so that's something that Alex that was like I say Alex and I were talking about whether to do that in the future is to move things into a more centralized uh, costing methodology I mean, you can just you can just sub accounts under there, but at least you know you got one yeah. you know, one common area. Exactly, that's what good we were talking about that. But it is kind of a, a change, and he was looking at whether Trio could do that easily. Right. <laughs> yeah, uh, easily uh, being the uh, very important word. What we could do if we decided to go down that route um, is essentially reallocate those other lines, um, you know, into into technology, um, the expense account is the same exact number. So there are reports that can be run with that expense code without necessarily moving everything around. Um, however, it's a matter of just presentation. So if the board um, and the budget finance committee decide that that's what they'd like to see, uh, I'm, I can certainly make it happen. Any other questions for Kevin? I don't see any other hands. Would you want to go to the, the CIP part now? And... Yes, please. Okay. So we are still adding in, again, like, like we talked about the, um, the ability to have a common backbone, a fiber backbone for the municipal network connecting all of our buildings. Right now, our, the point is we, it's almost impossible to do backups from the fire station, you know, do offsite backups up to the town office because the link over spectrum is so slow um, it actually takes two or three days to back up a server over that link so to get our off-site backups done um, but even then we are doing we have multiple points of entry into the um, isp which is spectrum and we'd like to get that fiber backbone in place um, but it's it's very expensive so we've been putting away you know try to put away fifty thousand dollars every year till we reach the point we can uh, get there However, uh, Don, I correct me if I'm wrong, but there's gonna be some money coming in from the government now uh, for projects like uh, fiber. So I don't know if that's, would do right. a match in with that or? That we were talking about that earlier. You know, it's, it's looking like we're gonna get around $450,000 from this latest uh, stimulus money. I don't know how that's gonna be allocated. We put in several different proposals and, uh, and I don't know if, if that's gonna be the governing you know, um, I guess framework or not, or if it's going to come as a direct grant aid. I'm sure it's going to have qualified expenditures attached to it, and and broadband and internet and technology and and all of that is a big priority for the current administration, both state and federal. So I, I just don't know, but there is a potential there, I think, for this. So the next thing down on that is the two-factor security tokens. What we're looking at is moving into a more secure environment with our workstations and sign-ons. Um, uh, everybody probably is familiar with two-factor now uh, because a lot of you do your banking, you get an SMS text. Uh, ideally, what we do with the two-factor security tokens is you have something you have, which is the token and the PIN number, something you know and you log into your computer, you don't actually even have to know a password for your computer anymore. The, the hardware takes care of that. So, and some of you may have worked with that in some of your businesses. Um, they, I don't know if you're familiar with the secure ID tokens, been out there for years, but now um, two factors come way down. Uh, so we are looking at open source software to run it and just buying the hardware, which is $5,000 for the number of tokens that we would need to cover all of the employees. Uh, we're looking at end of life replacement for our um, servers for the net. We have a, the public safety server is 10 years old and the three network attached storage servers are over 10 years old and they are way beyond their service life. And we're getting some issues popping up left and right on those. Again, we buy all of these servers are uh, purchased one generation back uh, Dell servers, we buy the uh, direct storage part of them where the actual drives live. Uh, we buy that new, but the servers themselves are all used servers. We haven't bought a, a new server for the town of Raymond ever. So we save at least $10,000 per server by going to the you know, previous generation of server. 
so that's what those uh, last four uh, replacement end of life replacements are. Any questions on those? I don't see any questions, yeah. Kevin. Um, you know, I'm looking at the current municipal sites and they include Tasseltop, Sherry Gainan Park. What, what kind of uses would, well, would be at those locations? Yeah, it's, well, th those are municipal sites. The Sherry Gagnon Park is where we drop one because there's been interest in putting uh, cameras there, security cameras. And we could okay. put public Wi-Fi there also. So that that is those list of sites that we'd like to hit with the fiber. And if you look at it, we start the Sand and Salt building. You go down, you know, uh, 85 across uh, by the park there and over down to the uh, public works building, past the library, so we can get almost a linear track of all of the buildings. Although we'd have to go to Tasseltop, which is a little bit out of the way, but if we did that, we might be able to, oh, and Joe in, uh, showed some interest in Raymond Beach uh, also having uh, internet service because he'd like to have a security camera there and internet capability, I guess, for somebody that may or may not be there monitoring the beach. So we'd, we'd like to be able to, you know, I mean, I'm not saying I like to be able to, the town would, has shown interest in having that kind of connectivity to all the buildings. Okay, that makes sense. Any other questions for Kevin? Thank you very much, Kevin. At this time, I'll allow some public comment. Can I? Go ahead. So I called the uh, interim Casco town manager, caught him on the road. And uh, so this is Don Garish, who's a veteran main town manager, spent his career in Brunswick. So she's correct. He's They're administering it that way, but I vehemently disagree. I mean, and for our purposes, we're getting an assessment. So we're not exposed to an, to, you know, to an over, overtime assessment, but uh, we're going to take a look at that as the town managers tomorrow and see, you know, how it should be properly you know, properly, uh, I guess, uh, uh, categorized. And, uh, you know, she does have supervisory authority. And the issue of, you know, having hours that she works but doesn't get compensated for, that's not, no. So anyway, we will, uh, we'll be looking at that. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking this should be a salaried employee. I'm with Joe on that. And so that's what I thought we were getting. And, and that's not how they're running it. And uh, so uh, we're going to have to have a discussion. So is that a job description in our package? I believe we did put whatever, she, whatever they sent, didn't we, Alex? Correct, yes. So... I would like to suggest that everybody watch last year's meeting, budget meeting, as to the description of her, when she stood up there and described what her job is, what the extra money went to. And I do believe Rolf also questioned about what the extra money was for. And it there's a, there's a pretty um, good description there. When I say good, um, as to she saying what the job entails what it was supposed to be and having that backup person was supposed to be there so i would really suggest going back to last year's budget meeting and taking a look at it and watch it because it's definitely not the same well we, we can we can do that but we're going to have a meeting of the town managers and and come back we'll we'll be back on this by the time we get to budget deliberations okay thanks Mr. Chair? Yes. I'm, I'm not really the public, but there isn't a lot of public sitting out there. Okay. And, I, and I do have one uh, kind of commercial announcement, if I could. Um, I haven't received or had any phone calls or inquiries as yet about anyone running for a budget finance committee. The nomination papers are available. They're due back on April 9th. 
And those that are up for re-election are Robert Goslin, Kevin Oliver, Sheila Burke, and Bob Jones. So feel free. Thank you. I plan on stopping by sometimes. I'll make an appointment. Go ahead, Don. Oh. No, I'm, I'm all set. Select board comment. Budget finance comment. Go ahead, Joe. Um, I requested that the meeting for April 30th be moved. Has any decision been made on that? I, I am not available on the 30th. No, there has been no mention of moving that meeting. Moving it to what, Joe? Well, I had suggested the following week, but. I, what I would suggest there is, Bob, uh, pull your pull your group, see if, if that works. And uh, we can, you know, the select board can, you know, I'll, I'll pull our people to make sure that there's not a problem. And if, if there's not any problems, then we can, we can just shift it that one week. Okay. So that'd be the week following March 30th. No, uh, I don't think so. Joe, it's which uh, which date was it, Joe? It was the April thirtieth. So it'd be 30th like the first week 30th. of May. No, it, it's March. Uh, it's March thirtieth is the next meeting, two weeks from oh. tonight. You said and April, I, sorry. And, and I suggest that we move it to Tuesday, the um, April sixth. April sixth. Okay. Well, on the you know the only one that's not here on the on the select board is Lonnie, but does the Sam, Marshall, Teresa, do you see a problem with that date? I'm good. So as long as it's, oh. as long as it works with the, the budget committee, then the select board's all right with it. I'll pull the people and get back to you guys tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Any other comments? I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. People want to stay I'm there. Joe did. Joe moved it. Joe moved. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. See you later. Thank yeah. you very much. Bye. Thank you.